Well, good morning again. If you would, take your Bibles and turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 9 are going to be the center of our focus this morning. Uh, you might be aware we've been working our way through 2 Timothy on Sundays, looking at the text uh, Sunday morning and evening and uh, trying to get a, a good grasp on this book and to see what sort of applications we need to be making concerning ourselves from what Paul writes to Timothy. And as we've gone through this, we've seen a lot of different charges that Paul would give Timothy. And from this, we can ascertain a lot concerning the type of Christian we need to be. Uh, as you look at Paul's letters to Timothy, 1st and 2nd Timothy, uh, whenever we went through 1st Timothy, we talked about how it seemed that the thrust of that book was written to keep the church pure, protected, and productive. And it speaks the same here in 2nd Timothy concerning the individual. And concerning the individual, how you're supposed to keep yourself pure, protected, and productive, as we go through this book, we can see a variety of ways that you're going to do that. From chapter 1, we see that you're going to have to be on guard. That's what Paul's main thrust to Timothy was there. Because Timothy uh, is at risk of the same thing that everybody is at risk at. Everybody's at risk of uh, departing from the truth. Everybody's at risk from making a decision to walk no more uh, with our Lord. Uh, and so Paul wrote chapter 1, encouraging Timothy to fan the flame, to follow sound doctrine, and to fight faithfully. Be on guard. Uh, chapter 2, looking there at verses 1 through 13, Paul was telling him to be a good soldier. It's not an easy thing to follow the Lord. It should never really be considered to be an easy thing. The Lord never considered it to be an easy thing. Uh, he understood that what he was going to be able to promise us is an easier burden than what we would bear if we followed the life according to our own ways. Uh, the Lord knew, of course, being God, that it is not right for man who walks to direct his own steps, as Jeremiah would affirm. Uh, the Lord knew that there needed to be instruction, but just because that instruction makes the burden lighter or more easy doesn't mean it's easy altogether. It's very difficult, and it's going to require a lot of action, and it's going to require a lot of service, a lot of suffering. You suffer not only for your own sake, but for the sake of others. And that's what Paul emphasized there in chapter 2 in verse 10. Uh, whenever you continue in verses 14 through 26, which we talked about last Sunday, Paul is telling Timothy to be a worker. He wants him to make a resolution there in verse 15 to be an, a worker who has been approved by God. No need to be ashamed. He's not going to stand before his Lord in the judgment and blush and be ashamed of the actions which he has committed or the things which he has withheld himself from, but he is going to be able to confidently stand before him by rightly handling the word of truth. He's also going to be able to confidently stand before him and have the confidence of being an honorable vessel in his house by chapter 2, verse 21, cleansing himself, purging himself, from any uncleanness which would coincide with the false teaching that was being taught. Not only the teaching, but the teachers themselves as well. And then you look there in verse uh, 23, going through verse 26, what is Paul telling Timothy to do? Paul is telling Timothy to be the Lord's servant. This is how he's going to conduct himself. And so in making a resolution to be approved, and making a resolution to be an honorable vessel and making a resolution to be the Lord's servant, he can be his worker. And so we continue here in chapter 3, verses 1 through 9, off of that. Be on guard, be a good soldier, 
they are worker. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 9, be aware. Be aware. What Paul wants Timothy to be aware of here are, are really three things. Number one, Paul wants Timothy to be aware, you see this in verse 1, of the problem of godlessness. Number two, you see this in verses 2 through 5. Paul wants Timothy to be aware of the practitioners of godlessness. And number three, what Paul wants Timothy to be aware of in verses 6 through 9, are the promoters of godlessness. Now we're not going to look at all nine verses this morning. We're going to look at verses 1 through 5, which means we're going to be spending our attention looking at the problem of godlessness and the practitioners of godlessness. And then this evening we'll come back at verse 6 and continue there looking at the promoters of godlessness. If you would, let's read this text, verses uh, 1 through 5, collectively, and we'll go back and we'll make some comments. He says this in verse 1, But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid such people. Let's look back at verse 1. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. Paul is making Timothy aware of the sober reality that... Um, is among religious circles. He wants Timothy to be aware of the problem of godlessness. As you consider religious people, uh, there are, uh, we might say there's four different categories. There's four different uh, circles within the big circle of religious people. Uh, and whenever I'm speaking of religious people here, I want to emphasize this. We're talking about the church. Whenever you look at the church and you take a spiritual inventory of it, you will see that you will have many in the church who will be apostate, who will not be faithful. And that's coupled with the fact that there are few that will be faithful. That's what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14. Matthew 7, verse 13 and 14 the Lord is talking about a very narrow way in contrast to a wide way. And both of those ways are a religious way. They are both the way that is trod by those who claim to be his. And he says there in verse 13, enter by the narrow gate for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. What's he saying? Among those who claim to be my disciples, who claim to follow my ways, who claim to adopt my behavior, they're going the way of destruction. Verse 14, he says, For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. When we talk about authenticity, what's being said there is there's a lot of copycats. There's few who are authentic. There are a multitude who are disingenuous, who are not the real thing, who are far from being his. No matter how much they claim it, no matter how much they try to portray it, they're not his. And it's because of their actions. It's because of their attitudes. All these things that we're going to see as we continue through our text. 
when you look at that category, the first one, many in the Lord's church will not be saved, but only a few. That's a sobering reality. And that's what Paul had made aware to Timothy already in this book. You see that in chapter 1, verses 15 through 18. He spoke to Timothy about all those who were in Asia who had turned away. And he could only single out, and I'm sure there were more, right? But for Timothy's sake, he singled out one individual, Onesiphorus. Isn't that quite the contrast? Verse 15, all who are in Asia have turned away from him. Verse 16, Onesiphorus. That's a big contrast. That's a sobering reality. Here's the second. The second is the presence of false teachers. That's a sobering reality. You can't trust everything you hear. You can't accept what someone says, even if they do it while holding their Bible. You have to be on guard. You have to search the scriptures daily, as did the Bereans, to see if the things which they are saying are true. Acts 17, verse 11. Jesus warned us of this. Jesus warned us in Matthew 7 and verse 15. He said, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. They're a reality. And they're a reality not just in a grand sense, but even in Timothy's context. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 16 through 18, Paul gives them names. Hymenaeus and Philetus. They're teaching a false doctrine that the resurrection had already taken place. And out of that, however it is that they're going about teaching further, they are leading people astray. They are ruining the faith, Paul says in verse 17 of some. It's dangerous. That's a sobering reality. Third sobering reality is the possibility of repentance. I think it's easy if we only try to serve God as, as we would desire to be served. I think it becomes easy to be filled with rage. We have someone who has taught falsely concerning the truth. We have someone who has adopted a false doctrine. We have someone who has departed from the faith. Well, if we try to serve God as if we're God, we might say, enough with that. No, you taught falsely concerning my words. You're not coming back. No, you began to act unruly. You began to act unholy. You're not coming back. But whenever we read 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 25 and 26, Paul is stressing something certain about our conduct, the certainty of our conduct, the way that we should act, and that we are to act if we are the Lord's servant is verse 24 with gentleness so that verses 25 and 26 that false teacher well he can return to the faith that person who wandered astray they can come back to the fold and that's what Jesus taught us Luke 15 think about this, the uh, parable of the prodigal son you had a son who defiantly in rebellion went away from his father wasted himself away came back and was readily accepted was celebrated over and that's a sobering reality because it is a constant reminder God's not like us God is not like man he does not harbor hate in fact he's really quick desirable to let it go, to resolve the issue, to take the person who is stained red, who is stained crimson, and make it as white as blue. That's the God we serve, and that's a sobering reality. The fourth sobering reality is the progression of godless, uh, godlessness. That's what we're talking about here in verse 1. Now, Jesus made us very aware of this, that there would be people in spite of God's goodness and in spite of truth, and in spite of saying that there would, are some who 
would come back from the world, they, they're going to resolve in their own selves that we're going to continue in the world. We're going to continue in the manner which pleases us, in the way which uh, makes me feel good. That's what they're going to do. That's why Jesus so often stressed the necessity of following him. Continue faith. Uh, you see that in Luke 9 and verse 27. If any man would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow after me. He knew well that there would be those who would try to bear his name, but also bear the image of the world, and would not care. When we think about the religious world, whenever we think about the church, what Paul is stressing and what we need to be aware of here is that these things are true. And these things ought to sober us. It is true that in the Lord's church, there are many who will not inherit an eternal life. And there are few who will because of their actions. It is a sobering truth that in the church, you're going to have some who choose to be faithful, you're going to have some who choose to be unfaithful. You're going to have some who are going to choose to turn from their unfaithfulness back to faithfulness. And you're going to have others who choose to go from their faithfulness to unfaithfulness. That is the troubling times that Paul is talking about here. These times which take place in the last days. The last days is a reference to the Christian age. We see that in Hebrews 1 and verse 2. Hebrews 1 and verse 1 in diverse ways. In, in, in a variety of manners, God has spoken to his people through the prophets and so forth. But, verse 2, in these last days, God has chosen to speak to us through his Son. We are in the last days. And it's in these last days that there is hardship. And it's not just the hardship that is come from persecution, though that certainly is a, uh, a real thing and that's what Paul's going to talk about in this chapter in verse 12 indeed all who desire to live the life godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted no questions about it no ifs ands or buts it's a reality it's a truth that's hardship but there's another level of that hardship and that is that the church internally is going to have some turmoil there's going to be apostasy. Whenever we think about the church, we see this image being used of the church in Isaiah chapter 5. The church is like a garden. And in that garden, you're going to have some healthy plants that yield a lot of fruit. They're going to yield some produce. But also within that garden, are you not going to have weeds? Are you not going to have plants that wither away? You all? That's a reality. That's how it's going to be in the church. And so therefore, Timothy needs to, and think about ourselves here, we need to be aware, soberly aware, soberly understanding of the fact that uh, these things are true. We can't continue in blindness. And that's what Paul's trying to bring Timothy to understand. Because chapter 2 ended on a, a fairly high note. You're going to have, and you can have those who have spoken falsely and acted falsely, who can return to God. But Timothy, there's also going to be those who belong to God who are going to say, we don't want to do that. We're done. We're out. It's sober and reality. We need to be aware of it. Number two. Verses 2 through 5. You have the practitioners of godlessness. Timothy needs to be aware of that. There's a variety of reasons why he needs to be aware of that. But first, let's go through and look at some of these character traits. Look with me in this text at the words surrounding love. The words surrounding love. You have four different times in these 
and really in verses 2 through 4, is three verses where Paul is going to use some form of love. Not the form in the sense of, you have agape love, galeo love, storge love, and so forth. But he's going to use a word that has that root of love. And uh, what, he's, what he is bringing out is the fact that you have these people who are going to be practitioners. They're going to practice in their own life godlessness. And that's going to be demonstrated by their godless love. Their love is going to be so far and so contrary from the love that is expected of a disciple of Christ. You see in Mark 12, verses 30 and 31, Jesus was being tested. He was asked, Rabbi, which of these is the greatest command? And Jesus said, Mark 12 and verse 30, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second one is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other command greater than these. They're, the two are held together. You can't say I'm going to love God but hate my neighbor. First John 3 and verse 10 tells us that if we love not our neighbor, we have not the love of God. They're coupled together. They're just as essential as the other. And that's what these individuals are lacking. Because you see here, first, as you look at the shift in their love, the shift in their love is going to go from God and neighbor to just self. They will become lovers of self. They're going to be selfish. They're going to practice a selfishness which focuses on their own interests to the exclusion of God and to the exclusion of others. We see second that they are going to become lovers of money. They have an obsession with materialism. And there's a variety of ways that this might manifest itself. It might manifest itself through the exploitation and the peddling of the gospel. Paul has already fought that battle in uh, 2 Corinthians 2 in verse 17, reassuring the brethren there in Corinth that we are not like such who are peddlers of the gospel. But it also might manifest itself in a different way. It might manifest itself in compromise the Christians are going to be persecuted part of that persecution is going to be lethal another part of that persecution is going to be legal they're going to be legally pushed out of the marketplace they're going to be legally withheld from being able to sell their goods or buy goods they're legally going to become men on islands while still being on dry land while still being tied to a whole country of people they're going to become their own people legally and you're going to have people who are going to say well maybe we can adapt some of the things that we believe so that we do not become so repulsive to the people Maybe we can change our message so that we do not offend the people. Maybe we can change some of our practices so that we are more palatable to the people. Maybe they'll begin to treat us like the Jews if we embrace some Judaism. And if they don't have a problem with the Jews. Maybe they won't have a problem with us. Hey, maybe what we need to do since people had such a big issue with it, you, you can see this in the insurrection that took place in Ephesus. You can see this also in the uh, insurrection that took place in Thessalonica. Part of the reason that they were so upset with the Christians is was that they were proclaiming Christ to be king. Jesus Christ is king, saying that there is another king but Caesar. Maybe we need to just remove that from our vocabulary. Maybe we need to remove that from our preaching. Maybe we don't need to talk about him that way. Maybe we need to start teaching. Think about how many people have done this. Maybe we need to start teaching a God who is all accepting, all compromising. 
and requires nothing. Maybe that's what we need to do. So that we can have the things we want. So that we can have the things quote unquote we need. So that we can have the comforts of one. You know, Demas forsook Paul, chapter 4, verse 10 of this book, out of the love for this present world. It was getting too difficult, and he turned away. It was becoming too challenging, and he turned away. Too costly, and he turned away. Perhaps that's what we're seeing here. Lovers of money. That manifests itself in a variety of ways. The third shift in their love is that they will not be lovers of good. Uh, the word there, not lovers of good, that's all one word. And it's a or a philagathos. A philagathos. And what that does is that describes someone who has no interest in the benefit of others. Someone who is unwilling to be benevolent. Someone who is only self-serving. Now you look at those characteristics. Not interested in the benefit of others. Not willing to be benevolent, only willing to serve self, and you tell me right now if that fits into the model of Christianity. John 13, verse 35. Jesus speaking to his apostles. By this they shall know you are my disciples, by your love for one another. That's not the Christian model. It's far from the Christian model. You have Romans 12 and verse 10, for instance. The Christian model. By this, or rather, love one another with brotherly love, brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor or kindness. That does not fit. That Christian characteristic does not fit someone who is not a lover of good. You have Romans 12 and verse 13. Contribute to the need of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Again, this Christian characteristic is far different from the person described here. You have Galatians 6, verses 1 to 2. Brothers, if anyone is caught in a transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in the spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. That's a Christian characteristic. That is not these people. Galatians 6 and verse 10. So then as we have opportunity, do good to everyone, especially those of the house of the faith. That's a Christian characteristic. That is not the godliness. Their love is shifted. Romans 12, 10, 12, 13, Galatians 6, 1 and 2, Galatians 6 and verse 10 are just a, a small picking of verses that remind us of how our love ought to be. And that is not the love being manifest by these people. You continue. They will become lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. They are going to occupy themselves with the things of this world rather than the things of God. What they are going to do is they're going to become entangled in civilian pursuits. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 4. Paul says, no, 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 that's not what a Christian does. They're going to choose friendship with the world no, 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 that's not what a Christian does, James says. James 4, verse 4. Oh, you adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? That's a decision they're making. We want to be like the world. We want to do what pleases me. I don't care about what pleases God. That's what they're saying. That's the massive shift in their love. And you see a shift in their attitudes as well. As you look at the attitude that is supposed to be manifest by a Christian, we could go through a whole list. Kind of like Paul does. Paul gives us 14 things, 14 attitude changes that are negative here in this context. But if we were to summarize it, the attitude of a Christian is this. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Philippians 2, verses 3 through 5. 
that's the summary of how my mind is to be, of what my attitude is to be, my disposition. And that's not what's being manifested here. Fourteen attitudes that they embrace which are contrary to Christ. They become proud. That's the first one, or boastful, thinking that they are self-sufficient because of a variety of achievements. They become arrogant or haughty, asserting themselves as superior to all others, and that's to the inclusion of God. They become abusive or railers. The same word here that is defined as abusive, railers, is the word for blasphemy. That means that they are removing respect from their speech, and it's a no-brainer that you have this next characteristic that comes right after. They remove respect from their speech. Then what happens? They become disobedient to their parents. They've already removed the respect from their speech. Why not remove it from your actions? Why not just have rebellious words whenever you could also have rebellious actions? Just go full rebellion. Look at how it continues. They become ungrateful or unthankful. That means that they begin to feel as though any good that is done to them is due because of who they are. They become unholy. This is demonstrating conduct that foregoes God's law and in its core is anti-God. I do not care. I'm going to do what I want. They become heartless. Without natural affection, your translation might say. That means that they become void of family love. That close-knit relationship that is, that is supposed to exist there between mother and father and brother and sister. They don't care about it. They will carelessly and they will quickly ruin that relationship if it benefits themselves. They become unpleasable. They stubbornly refuse reconciliation under any condition. They become slanderous. The Greek word here is diabolos. It's the namesake of the devil. Use Matthew 4 and verse 5. Matthew 4 and verse 5, when you read in your Bibles, it says that the devil came to tempt him. It's diabolos. These people become like the devil. How does the devil work? Through lies. How does he work? Through accusatory words. He's a liar from the beginning, Jesus tells us. Later on, we see there in Revelation chapter 12 that he is called the accuser of the brethren. That's who they become. They become those who are without self-control. The Greek word there is akrates. Literally means to be without power. This is a word that in classic Greek, so like the type of Greek that you see Plato using, Socrates using, they would use this to describe someone who overate. They would use this to describe someone who indulged in sexual sins. And they would use this word to describe someone who had no restraint in their speech. They literally did not ever hold themselves from indulging in whatever passion was in front of them. They saw and they acted. Animalistic arms. Well, speaking of animalistic, this next characteristic is they're brutal or fierce. That's a word that means untamed, savage. And there is a Greek philosopher, Epictetus, who would describe this word, this character trait, as someone who has forgotten their divine origin and acts like a lion, meaning that they see people as prey. You continue, these people, the godless, they become treacherous or traitors. The same word that's used here is used of Judas in Luke 6 and verse 16. It describes someone who is ready to betray others for their own gain 
or security. And then last we see, or a second from last, we see that they become reckless. They're headstrong. The Greek word here literally means to fall forward. Your head is so heavy, it causes you to fall forward. They become quickly triggered, is what's being said here, to wrath and to words and actions which are unbefitting of a Christian. And the reason why is because the words and the actions come before any thought and consideration. It's ungodly conduct. They become swollen with conceit, puffed up, filled with pride, exuding arrogance. It becomes the core of who they are. That's the shift that has been that has taken place in their attitudes. They have a godless love. They have godless attitudes. And you see there in verse 5, they have godless religion. Notice verse 5 again. Having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power, avoid such people. What does it tell us about their godliness? It is a mere appearance. The same type of word that's used here for appearance is the same type of word that is used for counterfeits, for fakes. They, this word would be described, uh, a good way to imagine this word, this is how it, it's depicted. Again, the Greek is a very visual language. They have words and they have descriptions to help you see that word. One of the ways that this word is described is you go to a market and you're looking to buy a plate. The way you would test a plate's authenticity is you would take that plate and you would hold it up in the light. And that light would be able to expose if there was a crack that had been painted over. That plate that has that crack in it, that's that disingenuous, that one that has the appearance of it. And that's what it's being described here. What you have here is an outwardly pure, but inwardly decaying faith. What you have here is a disingenuous, non-authentic, a knockoff of Christianity. One that only concerns itself with what it shows and not what it is. And you can't help, you can't help but look at this description and think of the Pharisees. When you think about the Pharisees, think about this. Matthew 23, verses 2 to 3. Notice what Jesus said about them. He's speaking to the people. He says, the scribes and Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So do and observe whatever they tell you. But notice this, but not the works they do. For they preach, but do not practice. That tells us a lot about what's going on here in verse 5. They preach, but do not practice. Continue Matthew 23, verses 27 to 28. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones, and all uncleanness. So you also appear righteous, outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. That's the scribes. That's the Pharisees. That's the people we're reading about right here. We're not reading about scribes and Pharisees, but we're reading about the exact same type of people who feign religion. Jesus said of the scribes and Pharisees in Matthew 15, verses 7 through 9, He said, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. That's what we're talking about. A hypocritical, disingenuous, just outwardly beautified, inwardly decaying faith. If that's the type of faith that the Pharisees had, what was the end of that? What is their reward? Well, Jesus tells us on multiple occasions in Matthew chapter 6, that the hypocrite's reward is exactly what he's yearning for, which is the praise of men. 
He's not going to receive the praise and the exaltation of God. What else does he say concerning the Pharisees and their righteousness and, and, and what it is uh, in, in, in all actuality? In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 20, Jesus told those who were listening to him as he had just begun the Sermon on the Mount, he said, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So what does it tell you? It's not a saving faith. It's not a saving religion. It is a rejected religion. That's what the scribes and Pharisees practice. That's what these people are practicing here. They just want to cast the image and yet deny its power. That's what he says here. They deny its power. They deny the power of godliness. Kind of interesting to think about. I pondered over that phrase for a while. How are they denying the power of godliness? They are outwardly showing signs of godliness, but inwardly are not godly. And you would think if you're going to try to win people to your side through the preaching of Christ, you would at least do some type of preaching about having Christian characteristics of some sort. Right? So then what does this mean? I think what Paul's saying here is that these people deny the necessity of God. They would not do this by their preaching, but they would do this by their practices. They have come to think that they can practice whatever it is that they want inwardly, so long as they are portraying the right things outwardly. And Jesus has some word about some words about this. You have Matthew 7, 21 to 23, for instance. Where Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord shall enter the kingdom of heaven but the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven for many will say to me Lord, Lord, did we not cast out demons in your name did we not heal the sick in your name and you can go on and continue through the list and he says that I will say to them depart from me, I never knew you you workers of lawlessness these are people who are saying hey we did everything right outwardly what's missing from that equation what is inward? What is in your heart? That's what's missing from the equation. How do we have the saving faith? Matthew 7, 24 and 25. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on the house but it did not fall because it was founded on the rock. You want a saving faith? You want to have a real faith? You want to have a faith that is contrary to this hall of shame, some people call it, right there in verses 2 through 5? Have a faith that hears the word of the Lord and does it, both the inward things and the outward things. Have a faith that seeks to manifest in your life the image of Christ. Christ is far more than his signs. He is far more than his benevolence. He is also his character. And so to have a real saving faith, not only do the works which he did, but be the man who he was. This morning, what we looked at is we looked at two of three things in this context that Paul wants to make Timothy aware of. We looked at the problem of godliness there in verse 1, and then the practitioners of godlessness, or the problem of godlessness in verse 1, and the practitioners of godlessness in verses 2 through 5. And I think that seeing and understanding these things are vitally important for us. Uh, and I, I would say especially for these two reasons. It's important for us to study this because, number one, a proper understanding of these things can help keep yourself pure. Not only does this allow us the insight into being able to recognize these qualities in other people, 
and then to create the create uh, create the correct boundaries between us and them, so that we can maintain our own purity. Uh, but not only does it do that, but it also allows for us, if we do as we are told in Scripture, Second Corinthians thirteen. Verse number eight, examine yourself to see whether or not you're in the faith. If we are being the Christians that we ought to be and continually going through that process of self-examination, then we have 18 different things that we can use as a benchmark. And whenever we see these 18 different things in our lives, we know what to correct. We know how to keep ourselves pure. We know how to get back on the right path. That's the first great reason why this section is necessary. The second is this. A proper understanding of these things can help you keep others pure. Paul had emphasized to Timothy, if you're going to keep yourself pure, widen your window. Open your scope. Stop looking at yourself and look at others. That's what we need to do as well. We need to be mindful of others. If we see these characteristics in another, in one of our brethren, the people in the congregation here, the people who we worship with, when you see these characteristics in their lives, that's not a sign to run away. That's not a sign to shun. It's not a sign to cut them off. It's a sign to step in and to help. To call to remembrance the right things. Perhaps they have drifted. Or perhaps they are drifted. When you know and understand these things, you can help them to get back to shore. Examine yourself. Examine your brethren. Not so that you can cut them down. Not so that you can shun them. But so that you can heal. Heal yourself and heal others. This morning, we talked about godlessness. We talked about practicing godlessness, basically. And the obvious question is, is that what I'm doing? There's 18 things right there. 18 things. Are they in my life? If they are, here's a nice thing. You're not the only person. Definitely not the only person for all of, all of humanity. And another nice thing is like chapter 2 25 26 concludes God will grant forgiveness if we're faithful to confess our sins and he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all iniquity first John 1 verse 9 so if there's a change that needs to take place let's make the change with the confidence that God is willing and desirous and capable of receiving us back. This morning, if anybody has a need of the congregation, if you have a need for prayers or a need for study, if you desire to know more about being a Christian, we would love to help you with that. We would love to talk with you about the, the things that Christ expects and the way which you come to Christ. You come to Christ through hearing the gospel, Romans 10 verse 17, believing the gospel, and the person of the gospel of God that he is, that Jesus is the Son of God, John 8, 24. Repenting of your sins and being baptized, Acts 2, verse 38. Confessing Jesus as your Lord, Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. And remaining faithful unto death, Matthew 10, and verse 22. That's how you come to Christ. Uh, but perhaps you desire more conversation about that. We'd love to help you. Whatever your need is, you can make a note. It's good we stand. That's what we're saying. Who the Lord is there?